You know, Turkey was going through interesting times. We were, how do you say, a little less than democratic recently. When I saw the state of emergency declared on TV, I told my wife, don't worry, Allah does not shut a door without opening a window. We were already fired by a government decree, and now anything was possible. They started arresting people en masse. Then my time came. They put me in prison with terror charges. Yes, terror charges. The naive art teacher had been looking for a career in terrorism after all. Then my trial began. That was nothing against me. I was relaxed. Referring to the school that I worked at, the judge said, Hey, our children studied at these schools and asked me about the coup attempt. I said no. I didn't think the teachers were involved in the coup or any other operation against the government. I also said I thought the coup attempt was a little bit fake. I drew these pictures with a ballpoint pen. Then I shared some of them with friends outside the prison. All of a sudden, I had become an anonymous painter on social media. On the inside, people looked at my drawings with bittersweet smiles on their faces. Everything that was sweet was somewhat bitter there anyway. We knew that we were being persecuted by an angry government. We just did not know what our crime was. Of course, those days would pass, and the whole world would see that. So, let's see some of those drawings. In this one, we are being routinely assembled and counted, that is one in the morning and another in the evening. You're reduced to a number there, and this is insult after injury. You're just plus one of whatever the person next to you is, and you're expected to shout it out as if you are proud of it. As more people came in, the ward got overcrowded. Then a little more, then more. We started using floor beds. We were packed like sardines. Then we put it to vote and decided that we would all stay in the bunk beds. That is to say, three, four of us sleeping in shift. I would specifically look forward the evening and night prayers. I'd be very peaceful at those times. We were all equal. Equal in deprivation, equal before God, equal in solidarity. No one there was more than a humble servant of Allah. It was 20 of us in C7. There was always hot tea as long as the courtyard was open. We played volleyball every week. I was very happy. It was kind of comfortable. I think now learned helplessness was settling in. Anyway, I had six beautiful weeks there. Since it was a small room, we would be jammed like sardines again during the evening counts. A card system was developed to use the toilet as we had less time with more people in the ward. Very basic needs were given a very limited time and this created a scene every once in a while. Yet, when there was an old person with prostate or if someone was sick, exceptions were always made. Sleeping in the ward There was an interesting order. If you went to bed on time, you had a chance to sleep in bunk, yet you may have to share it. If you didn't, you would sleep on the floor bed. If you get up early, you made no noise. Those over 50 years of age were exempted from daily duties, such as preparing the meals, cleaning the table, and wiping the floors. We did not sleep after the morning prayer. Every Sunday, there was a general cleaning. I mean. You shouldn't have anything left in the open after 10 a.m. or it would have gone into trash. Even the studio apartments in Tokyo had larger kitchens than we had in C7. A mini fridge was placed under the stairs. 
On a narrow shelf, there was some junk food, nuts, tea, sugar, salt and spices. Tea samovars were on the counter. We used the sink to make salads. The bread bucket and trash were under the counter. Napkins, plastic forks and spoons were on the top shelf. Since it was 20 people who used this small kitchen, it had to be organized like a Swiss watch. We celebrated the Eid. We were excited. We were not free, yet we were humans and the Eid was meant to make humans happy. We would then watch TV. In the following hours, as the elderly went upstairs, the TV used to be muted. We would speak in whisper and play charade. On the inside, every minute counted. As there was no washing service in prison, we used to wash our clothes in the bowels. Later, to increase the persecution, the amount of water was reduced. For bleaching, some friends developed a new method. They took the 5 liter water bottles and put the laundry through the hole, added some bleach and water and then shook and drained it. A laborious yet effective way of staying clean. After the morning count, we would have breakfast and relax. That would have given us time to worry about our loved ones on the outside. Paradoxically, no time was wasted in the ward. Some studied, some read books, some made small souvenirs like rosaries and stuff. Instead of killing time, we were busy using it. We started some lectures of English, math, physics and even medicine. We had no shortage of expertise in the C7 after all. After classes, we had conversations on spiritual issues that would last until late afternoon. As people from different professions, we discussed our perspectives on spiritual issues as well as the affairs of the world. Different perspectives enriched those conversations and turned them into great foods, not only for the mind, but also for the soul. My father was transferred to a prison in Alanya, a town by the Mediterranean. He told me that it was like heaven. Funny thing, he had liked the prison there. Yet, sooner than we would like, he was transferred back to my prison. We were not allowed to see each other since he was in a different ward. One day, he called me from the other side of the door and we talked through the door opening while my friends covered me. A week later, on Friday afternoon, my father came to our ward. Happiness was just following me, don't you think? We put a tea box onto the wall and in it the cards with consecutive numbers on them. Everyone had a number. When your number is up, you use the bathroom. No more, no less. In this way, we did not have to wait at the toilet door. Of course, there were rules. Someone else could not use your card. No cards before bed, etc. Well, we needed a system and this one worked pretty well. The visiting days. Visiting day was once every two months in our prison. We would wait for two months to have an hour with family members. Newlyweds, fiancés, young people, old people, and most importantly, children. All of a sudden, they remember that they are children at the fullest sense of the word, that is, in the presence of their father, be it for an hour. After this hour, though, tears started flowing on both sides of the bar. As the ones inside had to adapt themselves to their new environment, the ones outside had no less adaptation to do for their less than usual lives. As we curl up in fetus position on our bed, they get on the prison bus, oscillating between a naive hope and sheer despair. Pulling the blanket on top of our heads, we would then weep inwardly.